So I, I just hope you understand my Geordie accent. I will try to be posher than Cheryl Cole, but sometimes I struggle. So, so I'm going to fl flit through a few things and concentrate more on the CBT. So I, I, I use CBT for all respiratory conditions, but I did my PhD doing a randomised control trial using CBT in COPD patients. So I'm going to focus on COPD for, for today. But we all know it's a very common condition affecting 3 million people in, in, in the UK. Um, it causes significant morbidity and mortality. And uh, many years ago, I interviewed patients from their perspective on what it was like living with COPD. And, and I've got some patient quotes coming up. It was really quite sad. So we know that COPD affects all activities of daily living. I'm going to take my glasses off. I can't see you, but I can see my screen. And we know it's very costly. And I don't know about Scotland, but in England, the CCGs are very keen to try and reduce hospital admissions because it, causes, it costs an awful lot of money. But two of the most uh, common comorbidities um, caused by COPD are symptoms of anxiety and depression. And for my study, I screened 1,500 patients, and 59% were anxious, 44% were depressed, and 75% were anxious and depressed. Now, it might be that Newcastle is a very stressful place to live, mm -hmm. and that elsewhere, like Scotland, it might be beautiful, and everybody is dead, chilled, and relaxed, and anxiety is not a problem here, but how many people would know the prevalence of anxiety or depression in their COPD patients? Put your hand up. Excellent. We've got a couple. And that's the problem. We don't know what the problem is. We don't look for it. And we know that COPD causes, causes deaths. And it's quite interesting that if, if, if we're trying to affect hospital admissions, reduce them, and we know that if people are admitted to hospital, 15% will die within three months, 25% will be dead within a year, and 50% will be dead in five years. So that, it's not great coming into hospital. We do our best to keep people out. But what we're not doing is addressing anxiety, which is a driver for hospital admissions. So if you want to address hospital admissions, perhaps you should look at your anxious patients. So just thinking about the impact of COPD on, on, on a patient, this, was my, this is my kind of graveyard slot quiz for you to keep you awake. So this is Ethel at the top there. Have I got a little... Is there a... Can you see a little dot? No. So there's Ethel at the top. She's got COPD. She's breathless. The helmet represents what for COPD in, in activities of daily living? Have a guess. What, what does COPD... Sorry? Work. It was, you were nearly there. You, you, so COPD is one of the co biggest causes of absence from work or having to retire early. In my study of 279 patients, 5% were working. The rest weren't. What what's this next activity? Personal care. Personal care washing. Patients really struggle with um, getting washed and dressed. Forget the wine. That was just because I was looking for nice pictures and was drawn to that one. Um, what, what, is the, what activity of daily living is that? Eating, yes, yes. So eating, a lot of patients struggle eating and breathing and at the same time. Preparing food, it's all a big problem. What's he doing on the telephone? Communicating. Communicating, talking. Patients struggle to have conversations. They can't get to the phone quick enough, answer the phone. When they answer the phone, they can't speak. And sometimes patients withdraw socially because of that. What's the next one? Housework. But you can always, you, you can always uh, employ a cleaner if you can afford it. The next one? Shopping. Shopping. Socialising. Exercising. Any activity. What we do know, inactivity kills. It, keeps, it kills millions of people a year. And we actually, we try to get people to go to pulmonary rehab, but sometimes when I go and see patients in the home, I need them to move, just move a bit from the settee. Some people sit all day long. Perhaps it's just Newcastle people are lazy. And the ones that are assy, they just don't move. So we need to get people to be active. And I tell them, people die of inactivity. So this one's what I'm talking about today. Mental health, mood, yeah. Holidays, yeah. Relationships. Makes patients very frustrated. I couldn't find a frustrated Ethel, so she's had a sex change there. <laughs> 
So if you think, just for, for 10 seconds, would you like to live this life? It's an awful life to live. And so I've got some quotes, what some patients said to me when, um, 1999 when I did my master's degree. Um, I did some qualitative interviews. One said, when I can't get my breath, I think I'm going to die. I thought it was my last breath. I get help with the shower once a week. I'd like to get a shower more often, but I get very breathless, especially if I get my hair wet. Anybody here fancy a shower once a week? Because you're going to have to lower your standards if you get kind of things like this. I thought it was my last breath. The other shot problem is shaving. I can shave underneath and have to sit down and wait a bit, then shave some more. I used to shave every day. It's hard when it's things you're used to doing and can't do now. People don't think of the little things. And in Newcastle, I think it's easier to get lung reduction surgery than it is to get in an electric wheelchair. And we, we try to give patients a wheelchair and they've got nobody to push it and they can't self-propel. So it's the little things that we're absolutely not getting right here for these patients. The doctors only see you for five to ten minutes. They don't realise you have it 24 hours a day all the time. I have to work things out. Yesterday I started doing the stairs. I did four stairs and I'll go back to it tomorrow and do a little more. Over a period of time I'll get it done. They were trying to get this gentleman to have a home help. What is my problem with that? Sorry? Absolutely. He's breaking down a task at the small manageable bits. He's happy doing it. That is a fantastic coping stra strategy. And so what we're trying to do is take his independence away and stop him from being active. Not a great thing to do. I can walk about five yards. There is a bus stop just on Bentick Road. It takes me to the top of the street of the club. But I couldn't walk it. Sometimes I just sit and cry. You get depressed, anyone would. And this gentleman was a semi-professional footballer in his day. And he used to come to the chest clinic. Of course, we, we had uh, clinic appointments on a morning. And he used to be up at four o'clock getting his suit on and his trilby. And he was immaculate when he came to the clinic. But at a cost, because he was up for hours getting ready. So we have an, a COPD clinic on afternoon. It's, it's not rocket science here. Just change the way you work. Now, people have been going around, as Hilary said, probably for the last 10 years, doing these talks, trying to encourage people to think about the psychological impact of things. And I, I don't know whether I'm getting anywhere. I, I'm, I'm going to probably re be retiring soon. <coughs> but there is so much evidence there about mental health. And if you have mental health problems and COPD, that will affect your survival. You'll die quicker. You have poorer quality of life. Poorer physical and social functioning. Costly and more prolonged hospital admissions, which is something everybody's interested in. You're more likely to smoke. If you're anxious, you smoke, it calms you down. If you're depressed, you smoke, it might make you feel a bit better. It's the only pleasure you have in your life. You're more likely to decline pulmonary rehabilitation. You're more likely to want excessive use of medication. Oxygen, nebulizers, steroids, antibiotics. These patients want drugs to help them, just help them. And it actually doubles the cost of standard care. This is a nice graph from um, the King's Fund. And it just shows you lots of common conditions. And at the end there, you've got COPD and asthma. And the light purple is depression. And the dark purple is, is um, anxiety. And you can see pretty much, apart from stroke, anxiety is the driving factor there, problem there. But actually, it's, this is the proportionate increase in healthcare costs of COPD or asthma or whatever due to mental health problems. So actually not addressing their mental health is costly. So we know the goals of COPD treatment is to relieve short and long-term symptoms using pharmacological treatments, and there's millions on the market now, it's hard to keep up and non-pharmacological treatments such as pulmonary rehabilitation, and you've just had a session on that. And it is to improve the quality and the outcomes from our patients. So we've just recently, I work at Newcastle University, um, part-time free of charge, of course, um, as a researcher, looking at things. And so we've done a, a systematic review and meta-analysis on self-management interventions. We are pushed to do self-management um, plans in COPD, and, and we thought, is there any evidence that they're any good? So we, we, we looked at Cochrane reviews, we pulled out all the self-management studies, we pulled out all the interventions and the data, and we've analysed which interventions are helpful to you. And actually, 
There's three things. One, managing physical symptoms. Two, encouraging activity. And three, is addressing mental health. And the self-management interventions that address mental health were more effective than any of the others. And, and, and so we've just had that article published. And mental health is the one thing that we are not addressing in COPD care. So what I would suggest is that we need to assess patients' physical symptoms. Obviously, they've got a physical health problems. Their social situation and circumstances, and we're very good at helping get social services and social support. But I think we need to maybe focus now a little bit more on, on the psychological um, side of things. So just so we're all on the same page about anxiety. Anxiety is when we all, it's normal and universal. We all get anxious. And it's usually when you have some catastrophic thoughts, like I've got to do a presentation, I'll be rubbish. Or, um, you know, I can't get my breath, I'm going to die. That's a catastrophic thought. Or impending danger. If I go out, something will happen, I'll not get back. And I won't be able to cope. They reckon that prevalence is 36, apart from if you live in Newcastle, obviously it's much worse. And it's unrecognised and untreated, and often given antibiotics and steroids, and unfortunately they don't work. We've been doing a, a, a study, the DCAP study, which looked at exacerbation, mortality, uh, and predictors of mortality in, in five, well, hundreds and hundreds of hospital admissions, but I did 500 from the RVI. And, and actually, some patients said they'd had 24 exacerbations in the last 12 months and 24 courses of antibiotics and steroid. Do you believe it? Could you have that many? Or do you think that could be a bit anxiety kicking in and saying, Amy, chest's bad? Because in Newcastle, sometimes they don't see a doctor or a nurse. They just send the antibiotics and steroids by the pharmacist. So nobody's seen them, but they take the patient's word for it. I'm having an exacerbation. I need some uh, a rescue pack. So... Anxiety is really important, and as, as I've said, it's a significant predictor for hospital admissions. Depression is really loss of interest or pleasure in ordinary things and low mood. And even if you have sub-threshold symptoms, we can do something about it. In primary care, you are so well placed to get in early and prevent people getting really anxious, caught up in vicious cycle and really depressed if you get in earlier on. And it's easier to do. Depression is two to three times more common in patients with COPD and the prevalence is about 40%. But there's a vicious cycle. The less you do, the less you want to do, the worse you feel. And that, would, that affects us all. But often we focus on just the physical symptoms rather than the, the mental health. So the treatment of anxiety and depression is, first of all, you need to screen for it. Do some, some simple questionnaires. We've got five questions, two questions for anxiety, two for depression and one on panic attacks. If it's yes to any of those things, then we would actually... Um, am, I, am I not running out of time? No, no, no. Good, good. What time is it? Um, so, um, what was I saying there? I forgot what I was saying. Questioning. Questioning, yes. So, if it's a yes to any of those, then we would do a hospital anxiety and depression questionnaire. And a score of eight and above would be sim symptoms of anxiety and depression. It's not diagnosing it, but we treat symptoms. That's what the, goals, the goal is. Uh, first of all, you should be offering psychological treatment before drug therapy. But there may be some patients who de do need drug treatment, like antidepressants. And they might need a combination of them both. So what we've been doing in Newcastle for quite a while is um, we would give, we do their screening, we give, offer some information. So we give self-help leaflets, and I've got a top tips leaflet on managing breathlessness. Because it was interesting when, in my PhD, I found that people didn't like to admit they had anxiety or depression, but they did admit they were really breathless. So I thought, well, let's forget about the anxiety and depression. I know you've got symptoms of it, so we'll just deal with your breathlessness. So they come to my breathlessness clinic. It's not a CBT clinic as such, but I do CBT. And so we, we, we give them the top tips leaflet on managing breathlessness, which incorporates lots of techniques that might help anxiety and depression. Or we um, actually, in the NTW Mental Health Trust leaflets on the website, fantastic leaflets that you can give, give patients to work through. We try to encourage activity or exercise. So we've got a prehab course rather than a rehab course that comes next. So we're trying to get people with MRC2 to go to a prehab club class we've got pulmonary rehabilitation and we have the cbt clinic so i run three clinics a week 
um, and we have bet- the patients would have between two to six sessions of CBT. On average, they get three. But when I was setting all this up and been doing this for years, I kept getting told we need a randomised control trial to see if this works. So eventually, I was persuaded to, to do it. So I'm just going to go through what CBT is so we all kind of understand what it is. It's a psychological treatment that focuses on the patient's current difficulties and problems, not with a dropped on the head as a baby, as a child, and they're traumatised with that. We're trying to focus on the here and now, and we try to help people learn techniques and strategies that might help them cope better with their difficulties, their breathlessness in particular. Um, and maybe exerting themselves, there are strategies that you can use. CBT only works if the patient uses It's like your inhaler. If you don't take it, it doesn't work. So CBT is not the, the answer to everybody's problems or difficulties, but it is helpful if somebody's wanting to change and do things and help themselves. And patients learn to change unhelpful thinking and behaviour. So as a cognitive therapist, you actually look for unhelpful thinking, like it's really bad to exercise, you know, because it sets off your breathlessness, so you have to sit and rest. That would be an unhelpful thought. Um, Or that oxygen really helps us when the oxygen level is 99%. So you're looking for unhelpful thinking and unhelpful behaviour, like stopping doing things, becoming inactive, not going out to the pub with the friends, and doing things like that. So you do what's called a hot cross bun assessment. So you find out what the main, the main environment and trigger factor is for their main difficulties. So most of my patients, their main difficulties are, are shortness of breath. So we find out, like, who do they live with? You might know that because you're working in primary care anyway. So I find out a little bit about the family background, what might trigger the breathlessness. And um, because I'm the respiratory nurse, I then go to... What, resp- what physical symptoms do you have when you're exerting yourself? You know, so the breathless, the, uh, and there's various ones. I've got a case study at the end to show you how it all fits together. And then I'm interested in what do you think when you get breathless? And how does that make you feel? And what do you do? This sounds very touchy-feely rubbish, but I tell you, it's so enlightening at the end when you see it. And some people are not very psychologically minded, and they don't like thinking of, of doing any kind of um, CBT. So a good starting point is to say, tell me what makes you short of breath. So this is, I would sometimes do this, a spider diagram with my patients, just to find out what makes you breathless. Well, they might say, well, if I get a chest infection, my breathlessness is worse. And if I go in the cold air. So I try to get the pull out, all of these things. And you can immediately see that drugs will help some of these things, but not a lot. So it's a way to get in. Is Can we look at other techniques that might help you with your breathlessness? So for anxiety, in, in, in a little nutshell, I've got these, these are common techniques that I would use. So education, explaining about anxiety, and if you can't breathe and you think you're going to die, adrenaline will be released, whiz round your body and make your breathing worse, and you can get hot and shaky and horrible. M- patients love the adrenaline explanation. It's a physical reason why they're feeling like that. It might be exploring their thinking and behaviour and why they're doing things and, and what, what, what the background for that is. Distraction is a critical thing. You can only think of one thing at, this, at a time. And if you're thinking how bad your breathing is, it's obviously going to trigger frightening thoughts. So you want to break that cycle and try to get them to distract themselves. So count how many flowers you can see on the carpet or s- lights on the ceiling. Count backwards from 107. So as you're getting breathless, you're doing the distraction. It will take your mind off your breathing. Breathing control, simple, simple exercise. Forget about breathing in, just concentrate on gently breathing out. If you concentrate on gently breathing out, you automatically get a big breath in. Patients think that's a miracle breathing breathing, um, exercise. Positioning, we all know patients who actually walk around, can walk around a supermarket with a shopping trolley because they're anchored to something else. They maybe lean on a banister or a windowsill Anchoring yourself helps with the perception of breathlessness. Position, get, get, you get often patients have high muscles here because of the tense, getting people to switch off those muscles. Balancing activity between naught and 10. So I'll say on a scale from naught to 10, if naught is sitting, not getting breathless, 10 is you're gasping for breath, you're so breathless, you sometimes have a panic attack. It's no good to be either position. It's good for you to get breathlessness. The trick is how you manage it. So it's about a five. We want you to find your number five. 
You know you're getting breakfast, but you know you can deal with it. You're not going to be pushed over the edge and, and not be able to control it. So it's about helping the patients find their number five. Breaking down small um, activities into small, manageable little bits. Bending and um, blow as you go is a good one. If people say fashion, fastening their shoes is bad, so if you just breathe out, it helps you do that. Or if you're walking, blow as you go. Getting a cool air fan five to six inches ab from your mouth and your nose helps stimulate your trigeminal nerves in your face, apparently, and helps with the perception of breathlessness. That's something that anybody can do at any time. Cool in your face if you get hot and bothered, and it's you know, we often patients try to do this and, and get, but cooling yourself down can also help. Relaxation, anything that can help you relax, um, is, is, is really helpful. So, I think I've got a bit of time here, so I might do a little diagram for this. So, explaining about relaxation, if we think, so I've done the hospital anxiety and depression score, and it's 18 out of 21, so it's high. We want it seven or below. Now, if it's here and you have more stress each day, it's going up, it's going up. It doesn't take a lot to be pushed over the edge. So what we want patients to do is find a legal activity that they like doing, that they can just bring down their stress levels, anxiety levels, a little bit. We might never get them to seven, but even if you're coming down to here and then back up to here, it's, it, it's a little bit of a relief. So anything, whether it's reading a book, um, having a massage, whatever you like to do, relaxation is, is, is really helpful. Um, mindfulness is another one. There is a big movement about mindfulness. They say you have to meditate for 45 minutes. It would kill me to have to keep still for 45 minutes. So I think of mindfulness as uh, appreciating the moment. So it might be watching a little robin coming off in your, in your garden and, and watching it. And you just, no matter what's going on in your life, you can switch off, watch the robin. You're not bothered about what things, because you're just enjoying that moment. And we say that in palliative care when you know, look after lung cancer patients. And they're in the hospice, the family's around, they're having a cup of tea and a cake. And they're all laughing and joking. And you think, how can people be happy in this hospice here when it's, 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 he's going to die in a couple of days? Actually, they're just enjoying the moment, and sometimes that's all you can do. So for me, it, it is appreciating the moments, and sometimes walking through the park and noticing things that you didn't really notice. You can get through the park and think, God, I didn't even know where the flowers were out today. So it's just about paying a bit more attention than, than uh, you should. That's my version of mindfulness. Graded exposure is what we do in pulmonary rehab all the time. Patients think, I can't walk five yards, so we walk five yards, and then we walk six, and then we walk seven. And so by the end of pulmonary rehab, they can walk further, but it's in an environment where they learn to be able to do it and get a bit more confidence. Um, we also do that with needle phobia. So I do, I do a, um, a lot of graded exposure with people who've got needle phobia. And the final one is experiments. So um, how, many, how long have I got left? Uh, Five minutes? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, good. Ten minutes good, good, good. I've got well, good. Right, okay. So an experiment would be, I had one lady who had um, a terrible panic attack in the bath. For, for two years, she wouldn't go in the bath without her husband being present. So as a cognitive therapist, you're looking for safety behaviours. And I said, well, when he's in the bathroom, what is he doing? He says, oh, he, he sits there. And, you know, if he wasn't there, I would, be, I, would, I would have a panic attack. Well, I was thinking, I think he's a safety behaviour. So we'll maybe devise a little experiment. So we agreed that she would have a bath. And he would be in the bedroom next door. But we had a contingency plan. If anything happened, he, she would do our distraction, do our breathing control. And if they didn't work, she would call him for help. And he would come in and save her life like she thought he would. So off she went to do it. Came back in a couple of weeks. I says, how did you get on? She went, you'll never believe it, Karen. I says, what happened? She says, nothing. I thought for two years he's been sitting there and he hasn't done anything. Well, I could have told her that at the beginning. But did she? Would she took any notice of me? No, she needed to learn that for herself. So CBT is fantastic. In you let people fathom this out for themselves. They try it. It's not about giving advice. If you're giving advice all the time, you have to zip it. It's about what do you think you could do here? And, and you try to encourage people to, to come up with the ideas. So that was a behavioral experiment. Thinking about depression, I think depression is easier. It's explaining that it's this vicious cycle. The less you do, the less you want to do, the worse you feel. 
and activity is the normal remedy for depression. Taking antidepressants is fine. It might raise your mood a little bit, but you have to do something with it, and you have to be active. And so I just get people to do an activity diary, a list really, for two weeks and come back. And what you see is, because they're trying to impress you by being a bit more active because they're, they're filling this, this little list in, they're being more active and their scores are better. So the depression scores are better. It's, it's, it's such a really simple technique to do. And you might have to explore some negative thinking, like what's the point? Well, so you might have to do a few other things. And there are other techniques, millions of CBT techniques, one of them that I use a lot is the pros and cons. So what is the pros and cons? Instead of me telling you what the pros and cons are stopping smoking, can you think about it? Or should I have the chemotherapy? Should I take that medication? You can get, should I go to pulmonary rehab? Get the patient to think about it and fill in the pros and cons, and then you can discuss it. It's very, uh, it saves you a lot of time. So really, just to go on, my, the study was... Does CBT work? Does it reduce symptoms of anxiety? Does it reduce symptoms of depression? Does it imp reduce hospital admissions? Does it improve quality of life? And what training can we give people? So the study was a long-term study. We follow up with three, six, and 12 months. Patients either got CBT with one of us respiratory nurses and self-help leaflets or the self-help leaflets alone. And this was the, the scores. This shows that you might think... It's people with bad COPD that might be the most anxious, but actually you can see here there's no correlation between lung function and anxiety scores. You can have lung function 80% and really, really um, bad anxiety scores. So these are people, are in, they're in primary care, people with mild COPD, they won't come anywhere near me. So these are the results. There was a significant improvement in anxiety score at uh, three months and it was sustained at 12 months and it did improve hospital admissions it did improve quality of life and it did Im improve symptoms of depression so just to finish then this is the patient that i saw it was a 68 year old man previous coal miner very very anxious man um, ex-smoker declined pulmonary rehab very supportive family and his hot cross bone was any activity or even the thought of activity made him breathless what the thought of walking to the toilet made him bad that shows you how powerful the mind can be if you can bring on those symptoms by that physically he was short of breath he would sweat his heart would race his thoughts were i'm going to die this is my last breath to cope with this, he would avoid activity if possible, avoidance you're looking for and safe behaviours, there's the avoidance. He would sit down, we'll let him sit down for a while, yeah, okay. Turn on the cool air fan, marvellous, that helps. And he would shout for his wife for support. Well, that's a safe behaviour. His fe feelings, he said, he was very frightened all the time. He felt guilty having to have his family with him all the time. He was anxious and depressed. So the treatment was really, we talked about COPD, panic attacks, breathlessness and depression and how to deal with them. For anxiety, he was going to do distraction, planning and pacing his activities, breathing control, relaxation. For depression, he was going to do an activity diary and list and rate act activities for achievement or en enjoyment. And uh, I was going to follow him up four weeks by telephone. I hadn't done um, CBT by telephone. Now I do do home visits. So the outcome was, this was the Beck Anxiety Inventory, which I, I did at the time. His anxiety score was 63 out of 63 before the CBT. It miraculously went down to nil, and his depression scores were nothing short of a miracle. But did it actually make a difference to him? Because we hadn't changed his breathing at all. We changed how he was managing. He said, oh, I've never felt better. My breathing is much better. And if I'd rushed out with my spirometer, Hillary, it would not have been any better. I know that. He said, I plan things now and I'm do doing much more physical activity and going out more. He said, I feel a lot more positive and I've learned a lot in the last four weeks. So I followed him up for three years. He died at that point and he didn't have any inappropriate hospital admissions because he was having them for panic. He was admitted twice for non-invasive ventilation. So that is the caveat here. You have to be aware these patients have life-threatening illnesses. So don't just assume, do your relaxation, pet, you'll be all right. Because that might not be the case. 